it out there. Um, on, I put it on the um, Fridays with Fiscal so that uh, it's just easy for you guys to reference. Um, and I also put out one of Lori um, from last week, as well as um, she has, I think, uh, another one that she um, has not um, given me yet, but I will put that one out there as well. And then obviously, um, like I said yesterday, we are going to reschedule that last payroll one, hopefully here within the next week or so, um, and, uh, and get that last one out there for you guys. Okay, so yesterday we wrapped up um, the expenditure process. We went through uh, requisitions, uh, purchase orders, invoicing, and then we discussed the payables grid and then the disbursement grid and all the options underneath disbursement. Um, so today we're gonna finish up the transaction menu and we're just gonna move right along to the next menu which is budgeting and hopefully get into some periodic as well um, so that the final day tomorrow we can focus on reports and some of these um, system manager, um, or listen to me talking classic here, some of these system um, options and utilities and go through some of those. Okay, so again, I'm at my home menu here, so I'm just gonna pick up where I left off yesterday and um, I'm gonna go into receipts. And again, I'm on a different workstation again today. They've got me moving all over the place here to find an open spot here at our office. So um, bear with me, I'm on a different machine as well. Um, so in here, what I'm seeing again, and like we talked about yesterday, are the grids and all the different options that you can do on the grid. And one thing, for those of you that weren't in attendance yesterday, one thing that I had said to everyone when it comes to amount when it comes to amounts on the grid, is um, the more amount columns you add to the grid, it may impede the performance. Um, so if you know they really aren't using those amounts, um, try to have them. You know, tell your end users just pull in the amounts that you want to reference. You know, all the time. Otherwise, anything else like maybe the July 1st cash balance, they don't look at that obviously as much as they look at the expended or the fund balance. Um, so try to limit those and see if that helps, if they are having any issues um, with performance. Okay, so looking at the receipts here, obviously my current period is January of 2018, so I'm a little far behind there on that. Um, but um, in here, receipts is real straightforward. There's not a whole lot to it, and it looks very similar to what um, you guys are used to seeing in USAS Web. And so over here, again, your icons are the same. Um, try to keep these consistent throughout all of the uh, grids. So we've got the Create button um, up here, obviously, and then we have the ability to print, view, edit, or delete um, receipts. Um, so again, my privs that I have is I have admin access. So obviously your standard user um, isn't going to see as many menu options and options available on the grid like, um, I, like we would if we all have admin access. So just keep that in mind. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on create. And um, the screen I think looks similar to what you guys are used to seeing in the web. And yesterday I explained the create new and the close. So obviously this is a great uh, reason to use the create new when you're doing a receipt because if usually you know the end user has a stack of receipts to do. So check mark create new and then when they go in and after they create the receipt, we'll just go through a test one here. Um, so the receipt number, I'm gonna let it automatically increment. And then from here, the date, I'm gonna put in the date in of my actual processing month here. And then you got your received from. And then obviously when I tab down and have them, you know, when you're, you know, training your end users, um, make them comfortable with the tab key. They shouldn't have to be reaching their mouse 
all the time to get from one place to another. I know there's some things that they have to use the mouse for, but um, we don't want it to be too different from what they're used to doing in Classic. So tabbing will tab me right down to the plus sign, and I click on that to open it up. And so what it's going to um, list is the first item's information. I'm just going to say student lunches. And obviously, I toggle between receipt and reduction of expenditure. So those are my two options. I'm just going to leave it as receipt. And my amount, $200. And then the account code. And this was something, again, for those of you that may not have been on yesterday's call, um, we talked about how to enter in um, account codes either by filtering, entering in the amounts and using the hyphens as a break. So I can just start entering in um, my account code and you can see now it's pairing the list down to what I've entered in and then I just highlight the one that I want. That's one way. I can also do a description. I can start typing in the word food. And it's going to go out there and find all of those that begin with the word food. I can use um, wildcards for that. And we also have one of our newer features that we implemented is the account lookup. Um, we implemented that not too long ago. A lot of people were requesting it, especially requisition users. Um, they were used to seeing that in USAS web. So what's nice about uh, this lookup feature is I can go in and start entering, you know, the same information in here. And I also get the description in here as well as um, uh, what's been received so far and the percentage received, so they can see those balances. Oops. Other things you can do, you can search by description as well, and it will pull up anything. And if you've got a district that uses cross-reference codes, put those in there as well. So again, I'm just going to, I'm so used to using the filters now, it becomes second nature anymore, and so I'm just going to select this first one. and. Um, and then it also updates my total here, $200, and it also reflects in my total uh, items amount over here as well. I have the same capabilities. We have, we're trying to implement these same features in all the transaction processing programs, so I can go ahead and add another item, meaning it's almost like an insert. Um, so if I have like five items in there already and I want to insert an item between items three and four, I can use that option. Otherwise, if I'm just adding another item to this, I can use the plus sign down here. There's also the copy, which, you know, if they have repetitive type items where all they're really probably doing is just changing the amount maybe, then use the copy instead of the add. It helps them, it helps speed up processing. Okay, so at this point, um, because I have create new check marks here, when I click on save, it's going to save this receipt, and you'll notice that it keeps the window open for me to process another one. So they can get right into their next receipt and start processing that. Um, so obviously, um, if they're in a program, maybe not receipts, but something else where they just want the um, window to close, instead of create new, they can choose the close option. And what that's going to do is allow them then, after they save that transaction, maybe they're an account, adding a new budget account or something like that, it'll close the window out entirely. If not, it displays the contents of what they just posted and they have to click on the X. So in order to eliminate that step, they can use the close option and it will just close that window out so they don't have to do that extra step. So I am, I am hearing some feedback again. Um, so if you guys wouldn't mind muting your phones, I would appreciate that. Perfect, thank you. Okay, and so with receipts, so I, I go ahead and I enter that receipt there, and here it is, Sue Jones Cafeteria Receipt. So if I needed to create um, an XML file of this or a PDF file, I would just select that. I can either click on the print or maybe I'm doing all the receipts for um, today. Um, I could go in and you know, select all of those or even filter it on create a date. Um, and then once I have all of those selected, 
I can go to the print option up here and print those off. So receipts are real basic. There really isn't a whole lot um, with receipts. Um, and just like what I explained yesterday um, during the training is, you know, remind your uh, users about the report option, um, advanced query. What we went through an example of advanced query, and for me, um, um, one of my reasons as to why I want to use advanced query is I don't want to clutter up my grid, and there are certain things that I may want to run um, that I don't really need that column on my grid per se, but I'd like to have an advanced query on that. Um, and then I can pull up those queries whenever I need to run them. So that's one reason why I would use the advanced query. Okay, any questions so far about receipts? And I also have my chat window open as well, in case you guys have questions there. Okay, I do have um, a couple things here. Someone was saying something about the transaction configuration, they're not seeing it, and I'm assuming you're talking about um, transaction configuration on um, transaction configuration on uh, the actual menu underneath system. Uh, so I, I'll show you where that's at because you do have to, um, that should be out there. I don't think you should have to go in and install that. So let me go there first. So underneath system here, there is a configuration option, and then you see the transaction configuration, and this is a good thing to talk about since we're talking about receipt numbers. So when I click on that, you'll see all the different things that you can set up for them to use um, a certain set of uh, numbers. For example, the example I used yesterday, I was talking about uh, vendors, and when vendors are imported over, you're going to have your set of regular vendors they've been using, like 1 to 1,000, and then they have their memo vendors from 900,000 on. So what's happening, though, is it all gets imported in. They go to create a vendor um, in the redesign, and all of a sudden, when they post that vendor, the vendor number assigned to it is 910 because it's looking at that highest number that was pulled over from the import, and that was a memo vendor. And so they were asking, how do I get that to go back to that regular um, listing of vendors? And the same thing with receipts or any of these other transactions. If you have a huge gap like that, like it goes from, you know, the last regular vendor they used was 1,000, and then it jumps to 900,000, what you want your highest transaction number to be, for example, for the vendors, is 900,000. And so what happens then is when that vendor is created, it's going to look there and say, oh, 900,000 is my highest number. I have to, and it back, actually goes back and looks at, well, what was it before then? Because I can't go past that number, and it goes back and looks at that 1,000 number vendor and assigns 1,001 as the next vendor number. So all of these transaction numbers behave similarly to that. So same thing with receipts. If they had a big gap in receipts, and obviously they want to start at receipt number 10 instead of receipt number 100, make 100 the highest receipt number on file so that it starts there and then goes back and looks and sees, oh, 10 was the last one, so my next receipt number is going to be 11. So this is where that uh, transaction configuration is from. Somebody had also asked about um, reduction of expenditures in receipts. Yes, you can still definitely do reduction of expenditures. I kind of went by that a little too fast here. But in there, I'm just going to go back and edit and that's another nice thing. Um, I went in and created this receipt, and I looked at it and realized the amount was wrong. So instead of uh, $100, it should have been $200. Well, first off, just let me show you where this reduction of expenditure option is. It's right here. So you're just going to change it from receipt to reduction of expenditure. 
and that will allow you to change the type. And here, like I was talking about here, I put in the wrong amount for this receipt. I just posted it. I can quickly go in, make the change, and save it. It's so much easier than how we did it in um, UCF Web. We had to do reversing entries and stuff like that. When you're in that current period or in an open period, you can go in and edit that receipt. Okay. See, anything else with receipts? I'm just going to view one of these again to see if I missed anything. Um, we do have a clone option here that allow you to go in and clone it. And we do have a reverse option here. And you'll notice when I did that, it reverses the entire receipt. So, yeah, we did add this a while ago. I kind of forgot about this option. Um, so, and I have to see if that's documented yet. Um, but this will allow you to do a complete reversal of a receipt. And you see what it happened. I originally had $200 receipted into these two accounts. When I clicked on the reversal, it went in and put in a description saying it's reversing and referencing that receipt number, um, the amount that it's reversing, which is the total of these two items, and then I could just click on save. Or if I just wanted to, I don't know, just you know, reverse the first one, I could delete the second one and we'll only reverse the first. That's where it gets a little confusing for me. So I probably would be using reverse to reverse out an entire receipt. So let's say my receipt was like you know, 10 items and I just want to basically back the whole thing out and start over again. I could use this reverse option to do this. But if it's something where I need to go in and I realized on line item number nine, I did not um, put in the right amount, I could go right back in and edit that receipt and enter that in and make that change and update that receipt. So, so I think reversal too could be for you already recorded the receipt, it's been posted, you know, it was done last month, and now you need to go in and back that out, then do the reversal. So you can reverse that receipt, back it out, and then enter in what you need to. Any other questions? So those are the only three options when you're actually viewing a receipt. Edit, clone, and reverse. And then obviously your options here for printing, and then again, viewing, which gave us the edit, clone, and reverse options when we were viewing it, and you can't edit it right from the grid. And um, like I said, the delete is dependent on um, the prints and stuff like that. So I have admin, so obviously I can go in and add that stuff. One thing I wanted to, this, this reminds me of something we talked about yesterday, rules. Um, and we're going to get into rules probably more tomorrow, but um, you can create rules um, in order to restrict certain things. And I brought up our rules page here in our documentation, and um, I went down to the custom rules section, and we have started to document some of these rules where we're getting requests from ITCs about writing or helping to write a rule for them. We started going out there and documenting these rules that we have been um, creating. And so we have, there's been quite a few requisition rules. Um, let me sit that here and get out of here so I can scroll my down here. But you'll see that we've got a rule to require a delivered to address when creating a requisition. Um, and so um, there's lots of different ones here. It re requires a vendor when creating a rec. Right now when you're doing a rec, you don't need a vendor. It's not requiring it, but if your district wants it to be required, you can create these rules. Um, and so an account code, I was thinking I had a receipt one, but maybe not. Prevent requisitions, nope, I guess that's it. So those are the rules that we've had in place so far. Um, and like I said, we're going to keep adding to those uh, when we write more rules. I know that for um, ITC staff, that is very techy. There's <laughs> a lot of uh, code in there that I don't, I don't understand. I, I try to guess and I ask the programmers and then they um, help me out with it. But um, 
until we get much more comfortable in the system. Um, if there are certain rules that you need, um, we can help you out with those. Okay. I'm going to move on to refunds. Now, we used to have refunds and refunds legacy, <coughs> and we took out the legacy away. Um, and replaced it with the, the actual refund option. Um, so this um, is very similar um, to what you saw in USAS Web. Just a few little changes um, on the screen, but it is very similar to what you guys were used to seeing when you processed refunds in Classic. Uh, so right here, again, I can customize my grid to what makes sense. I'm just going to go ahead and create one here. Okay, and so um, the first thing obviously it's going to ask me for is a refund number. And again, that's something to keep in mind when it comes to receipts, refunds, um, and some of those other transfers, uh, distributions, air corrections. In Classic, you could use this, uh, the same set of receipt numbers. So you could, you know, your receipt was receipt number one, your refund was then just incremented to receipt number two, your fund to fund transfer used receipt number three. Um, it's different now. Those are all separate transaction numbers in the redesign. So when we were looking at that transaction uh, configuration screen, you noticed all those different uh, receipt number tracking, or sorry, um, processing transactions. So we've got one for POs, one for checks, one for receipts, a separate set of numbers for refunds. So this set is going to be separate from your receipt numbers. When we get into transfers, there's going to be a transfer number that's separate from receipts and refunds. For, so all of these are separated out in the redesign. Um, so it's just going to, if I don't put anything in here, it's just going to use the next number on file. And then I'm going to change my date here. Refunded to. So who is this going to be refunded to? So we could put something in here, or if we're going to be doing a check, when we go in and add the vendor, I believe it populates the refunded to um, field. So I'm just going to leave it blank for now. We'll try that out. The description, uh, student fees. And then I do want to create a check for this. So I'm going to check mark that. And it defaults to whatever my default bank account is. Um, my check date always defaults to the current date, but I need to change that for my test files. And then my vendor, I'm just going to start typing something in. And you notice once I selected this vendor, it also populated the refunded to option up there. And then I'm going to go ahead now and add my um, items. So let's say it's $20 for science lab. I'm going to go ahead and put in the account. And again, I have the ability to go in and filter, start typing in something, select the one I want, or use the account search. Um, and if this is all that I have for this one, I can go ahead and click on Save. If I have more to add, I can go down here and add another item. I'm going to go ahead and save this. Um, one uh, question that came through is, since you are selecting create a check, will only check vendors display, or will you also see electronic vendors? That's a good question. Um, I would, I don't know. I would think that it would have all of them, but um, I'm going to write that one down. Um, I don't know if it defaults on just the check type vendors. So what, um, what they're asking there is, you know, when we went through vendors yesterday, we had the default payment type. It was either check or electronic. 
So um, I'm not sure if the vendor here looks at both. I'm assuming it does, but I will double check on that. It's a good question. And so it posted it. Um, so at this point, my check has been created, but the, or the disbursement, I should say, has been created. But um, I also need to go in and assign a check number to it if I need a physical check to be sent to somebody. So we'll get to that here in a little bit. I got another question. Um, somebody asked as well, could you also create an example of when you would process a refund but not create a check? Yes, certainly will. Okay, so in here, I'm going to go ahead. First, um, I want to go and look at this first before we get started. So this is for Willie Adams. And so if I exit out of here then and go to disbursement, a little longer than normal here. And so um, I could go in and search for, um, like particular, I could go in and search for like a type if I want to narrow this down. I could also do the show printable like we were talking about yesterday and then just pick you know, the one that I want. So these are all the ones that are sitting out there that our check number hasn't been assigned to yet. So there's lots of different ways I could filter this refund. But you notice this one was Willie Adams. This is the one that I just did. So obviously he does not have a check number. So I need to go in then and select this and click on generate print file and um, assign the next check number on file or whatever I want to do here. I'm just going to put in a one and click on generate and it's given them um, that number then. So he's all set. I'm gonna go back to transactions and go to refunds. And then that XML file or whatever, you know, is to be used. I'm assuming most of you um, are using the XML file. That can be then uploaded into your third-party vendors um, printing software, and that can be printed out. So using example of using one without a check. So in here, I'm going to go ahead and click on create again. And I'm going to go ahead and put in the date. And in this type of situation, um, it's a refund that I don't really, I need to um, reduce something. So I could do like a negative receipt if I wanted to, but in this case, I'm just going to do a refund, a refund money out of a particular account. Um, maybe I'm going in there refunding out of there, um, and then I'm going to receipt it into a different account or something like that. But I just want to show you how you can just do a straight refund without doing a check tied to it. Um, so I can put some information in here if I want to. Um, at this point, I just want to go down and click on the plus sign, and I'm going to say it's $50. Uh, or something like that. And the account, I'm going to pick one of these. And then what happens then, I click on save. And so basically, you know, that was originally receded in at some time, the $50. I just took that back out. So now I have less money received in uh, that account because I did a refund. So with a check, when you click on that create check, it does go out there and open up um, a lot of different fields, like the, um, the refunded to based on whatever vendor I put in there, because that will be opened up once I click on create check. It'll automatically pull that into the refunded. Obviously, the check date gets open when I click on create a check, the bank account. Um, 
So yeah, so there's a lot of different things that happen when you're actually creating an actual check to go with this. Obviously, I do have, again, my edit, and I do have a clone. So if you're doing repetitive type of refunds, um, you can go ahead and pull up the one that you want and clone it to a new refund. Any other questions about the receipts or the refunds? Those are pretty straightforward. Not a whole lot to them. So the only thing that you would have to do, remember, when you're doing a refund, is you're not able to sign the check number here. It does create the disbursement, but then you have to go into the disbursement grid, find that, and assign a check number. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the activity ledger. Um, I'm still getting comfortable with the activity ledger, but it's, uh, I think, a great tool for our districts. I think um, they are kind of a little unsure about it when they first get in here. Um, for those that were diehard OINC users, this really is the replacement for them or those that used USASDW. Um, they really have those same type of features in here. It's just going out there and customizing the grid to what they want to see um, and making sure that, you know, it's set up to where it is advantageous for them to use this. Um, in the activity ledger, you'll notice there's nothing along the side here where I can make any changes or add things or delete things. It is a query. So you're just going in and viewing existing data. So one thing before we get started I want to talk about is this little guy over here. Um, this is a little button that limits the grid results. So um, you can go in, it, so it doesn't take as much time. You can limit this and make it as small as you want, and it's going to return, like, for example, 330, 300 uh, lines, or you can make it as big as you want, and you notice that the max is 2,000 lines. So, you know, if there's not a whole lot, I mean, who was going to read through 2,000 lines of uh, data? Um, but, you know, if it's something where I would recommend kind of setting this off to the smaller side, and I think that's what it pretty much defaults to, um, then that's something I would definitely do. Sorry, my screen just froze up here. Hold on a minute. I gotta go back in here again. Kind of freezing up on me. There, I think I'm okay now. Okay, and so that's what that little button will do. Um, also, you have the report option here. Again, that's something I think that would be very advantageous for them to use in here if they're going in um, and uh, wanting to get a result, like for totals and things like that, off of this. Um, we talked about using the report option quite a bit yesterday as well. Because basically whatever is on your grid, that's what's going to be pulled into your report. Okay, so on my grid here, I have got the date. Um, I've got the type. So I believe that this is a default um, field on here. I'm not 100% sure. I think it should be um, because I, to me I find it very useful. Because when I go in to, um, to have this in here, I can filter by a specific type. If I just want to see purchase order data, I can type in PO, and that's all I'm going to see is purchase orders. I find myself in here using multiple filters, not just one. So I'm saying I want to look for purchase orders for a specific date, um, you know, something like that. So I'm always using more than one filter when I'm in the activity ledger. Um, I have the vendor and the vendor name. I've got my PO, item, invoice, check, receipt, and refund if I want to. Um, i to move my chat window out of the way here. What else do I have? Um, expended amount, received amounts. I do have the amount. Uh, yep. Just, I just have the amount. Um, that I really don't need expended in receipt because it's going to pull whatever amount is on my uh, whatever type that I'm looking at. 
I've got the item description, and I've also got like certain um, account codes. So I've been playing around with this. I use this a lot when I'm doing testing and stuff. And the one thing I wanted to make mention on purpose is the account code. Um, I find myself using this quite a bit when I want to go in and look up um, certain transactions for a specific account. So you would just go in and start entering that particular account and you'll see that it's going to start filtering and then it's just going to show me all the transactions. And again, if I want to narrow that down even more so, I can say, okay, for this particular revenue account, now I just want to find anything from 2017, beginning of 2017 through the end of 2017, and then it's going to filter it even more. So you can see where you can get very specific here. And then from here, if I wanted to go even further, I could go in and put in a particular item description or something like that, or even a specific amount, and narrow it down even more. I find myself using the amount field quite often to, to look up a specific amount or something like that. So, um, so this is a really uh, great tool. Um, one thing, too, that I do in here, I'm just going to clear out what I have. is um, being able to see like transactions for um, a specific date range um, and or maybe for, uh, I'm sorry, for a specific transaction. So if I pick on a specific purchase order here, um, okay, so for this one, Right away, I can see that I have an invoice and a PO. And so what I'd like to do is after I put in the transaction, this one probably isn't a very good I, I, um, example, but you'll get um, the idea of what I'm talking about here. I can put in that PO, and then I can go to the date, and I can do a sort um, and sort it by that date range. And then from there, I can even sort it even more so. And maybe I say, well, within that date, I want to sort type within that date, or vice versa. I could do type first and then say, okay, within type, now I want to do a subsort by date. And I'm on a Mac here, so I'm trying to, there it is. So I first sorted by the type, and then within type, I was able to sort by date. So I can really get the trail of what happened on that, from that, on that PO from the time that it was created all the way down to the last check that was paid against it. Um, by just doing these filterings and being able to sort multiple times. So I find myself using that. So I get, it almost reminds me of OINC. Um, I can go in and just put in, plug in that particular PO and see what's been, how many items are on this PO. Okay, and then from there, what's been invoiced against that PO, and then from there, what's been paid against that PO. So that's one thing I have um, shown users, is to go in and play around with this and look up specific you know, transactions. Maybe they're looking up um, you know, what was posted this date range. They can go right over here again and put in a date range like the one I did earlier, and then narrow it down and maybe put in the vendor if they know what the vendor is, or they know what the account code is, and start entering that information in and filtering. Um, we do not have all the dimensions in the activity ledger query. We have fund, special cost, or an OPU, but we don't have everything else. So the only thing you can really do is in the account filter, I was able to do like wildcards. Um, and be able to use those. And I think I posted a ticket to somebody not too long ago about that because I think they were asking for the same thing, if there's a way to go in and, you know, specify. And I think I put something like, uh, I think it was like this, 2510. Um, and I think then it brought up all of my accounts that have a 2510 function. So this is one way of filtering. I don't believe going in and putting in, 
like I know it's 2510, but then I know that I just want um, a special cost center of all zeros. I don't think I was able to get that done correctly because, yeah, that's not going to look right. And if I try to do this, well, let me try this. Percent. Uh, percent. I'm really see. I didn't think that worked. Well, let me see. I've got my, I've got my, uh, I've got my object. I've got my special cost center. I've got my subject. And let's say I want the 300s. This is a long shot. I'm not sure if this is going to work. Look at that. So, if I change this. I don't know if I have all zero OPU. I do. So that is the way to filter. I got to update that ticket, whoever that was. Maybe they're on the, maybe they're on the call. Um, but uh, that is the way to filter in there um, in order to get specific dimensions. Look in here to see if you guys have any other questions. Um, one question was here, um, you just entered a PO to select purchase orders. You entered an equal sign for the PO number search. Do some things require a PO? Yes, um, for if you want like a specific transaction just to get that transaction number, you do want to enter an equal sign before the number. Um, yes, and you'll see that with all the grids. Um, so to select just a specific one, if you don't put it in there, um, then it's going to search for everything with that purchase order on down. So if I typed in 1,000, then it's going to show me 1,000 and then 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. So if I just want to see just 1,000, I have to do equals 1,000, and it will just limit just that transaction. It's a good question. So with this activity ledger, you know, just showing these tricks, to the end user um, on how to search in here um, using the account codes, using the dot dot for a range, and it's not just dates. I could do the same thing on a particular, you know, purchase order numbers too. I could say I want to see POs, you know, one dot dot ten, and it's just going to bring up those purchase orders. So you also see with the activity ledger the diff big difference between the activity ledger and like going to the PO grid is the PO grid is just going to show you the PO as a whole. You have to click on the purchase order, view it, in order to see all the item information. On the activity ledger, you'll notice it shows you every line item on that transaction. So it's going to give you the full enchilada compared to um, the PO grid. Okay, let me see if there's anything else That's about it when it comes to Activity Ledger. It is. It's just a matter of getting them used to it. I always thought it would be a good um, idea to um, get some examples set and then have like a, a little mini training session with um, the end user and say, you know, if you want to do this, this is how you do the Activity Ledger just to get ideas flowing for them to say, oh, okay, I could use it for this, or I could use it for that. So it may not be a bad idea to get some ideas, or maybe, you know, you've got districts that are already using the redesign, ask them what they're using the activity ledger for. If you know there are some that are using it um, quite often, you know, and they could give you examples, and then you could share those examples with new users that are coming on. Um, because I really think that this, you know, should be taken um, advantage of. I think this is a really good tool. Okay. Moving on here. I'm going to go up, and we covered Activity Ledger. We discussed the expenditure process yesterday, APs and disbursements. I'll go right down to distributions, error corrections. I'm kind of doing like the miscellaneous stuff that's in here in uh, underneath transactions. Um, distributions, error corrections is the replacement for um, FMODs 
um, expense supplies distribution or the replacement for going in and doing an air correction in USAS web using receipts and doing a reduction of expenditure and a negative reduction of expenditure or something like that. Um, so that's basically what this option's doing. So, excuse me for a minute here. Nothing spell. Um, with, with this, um, the total amount has to zero out. So I can't go in here and create a distribution and have a balance of $50. It has to be zero. So let's go in, I'll show you this. <coughs> so in here, again, a separate set of numbers for these. Um, and then the date. Go over there and add that. And the description, account, correction. Uh, so all these other things that you're seeing here were brought over from the import. So for those ACMA transactions that were done, um, the expense supplies distribution option in Classic, um, that used to warrant a purchase order and a check and a vendor and everything to make those uh, type of corrections. So those, some of those things will carry over so you can see those from the legacy system. Um, but obviously, you won't be using those for any new uh, distributions that you create in the redesign. So I'm going to click on my plus sign here and just show you an example. So here is the, I'm going to call it the incorrect account, my description and I'm going to put a negative $50. And so in the account that I'm going to be putting on here, I'm just going to pick one of these here. And then obviously if I tried to save this now, I'm going to get a message because I have a total amount of $50. So I'm not going to make, try to make a liar on myself. I'm going to try and save it just so you can see. And it gives me the error saying distribution total amount must equal zero. So now I got to <coughs> enter in where this needs to be charged to. So this is my reduction of expenditure. And this is my negative reduction of expenditure, if that makes sense. And then if I try and save this now, <clears throat> it tells me um, that it's been saved. And so it created a transaction. And if I go and look at those accounts then, I'm going to have a reduction of expenditure to the incorrect account and a negative reduction of expenditure, which means an expenditure to the correct account. Any questions with that? Those are pretty straightforward, and I love, love, love that I don't have to um, enter in, a use a purchase order and a check and everything um, to do that anymore. I'm going to go back to the documentation just to show you where some of the stuff's at here. And if I go to system, go back up to the user guide, and go down to transactions, just so you know where everything's at. Um, and I go to the, you'll notice that <coughs> we have the um, options on the side here, and we also have them over here with an explanation and a link that will take you right to that specific chapter. So if I want to go to distributions, it has information about how to go in and create a distribution. It has all the necessary information in here. Okay. I'm going to move on to pending transactions. And I'm not quite sure if these test files have any good 
They do. They have a couple um, payroll. Um, with pending transactions, you have the option of, um, well, what happens is if this is uh, connected to payroll and both systems, and you've got the USPS integration set, that's a post-import step that needs to be done. After the data has been imported in, one of the steps is to go in and set up uh, USPS integration. Um, that way, the two systems, you're going to do it in both uh, the USPS and USAS, that way the two systems are talking to one another. Because what happens then is when that payroll is posted in the payroll side, it's going to come over as a pending transaction underneath the uh, pending option in the transaction menu. And you'll know exactly what kind it is because of the type. Um, so you're going to have payroll types, you're going to have um, your board ret, uh, and you're also going to have your board disk options from payroll. Those three are going to come in, um, and then you can go in and do imports in as well for outside spreadsheets. Now, I don't have a whole lot of documentation on those. From what I understand, receipts and reduction expenditures are working right now. now Jody might say otherwise, but I'm pretty sure that's what I have heard. I just don't have enough information documented yet on these. When it comes to can I import purchase orders and stuff and invoices, as far as I know, no. That is not available at this time, um, or I don't, I'm not aware of it. Um, all I know is right now receipts and reduction of expenditures can be imported in. So I know we've had a couple questions from people on that, and so we're looking into that and getting some documentation um, available for people in case they do want those outside spreadsheets to be imported in. So for now, I don't have the board share of retirement or the board share of deductions. I don't have those options, a sample um, examples out here, so I do apologize for that. Um, but I do want to talk about those first before we get into this payroll example. Um, so when you are running those on the payroll side um, and you post them, they're going to come over um, with their types in here so you'll know which one is which. Um, and then what happens then is when you go in and post these then underneath pending transaction, it's going to go straight to a purchase order. In the old system, when you used board disk and board ret, um, in classic, it went to a requisition first. Um, but we uh, went past that and went right to the PO. So once those get posted in here, then the PO is created. And from there, if they need to make any changes to the PO, obviously they can. And then they just move on with the rest of the expenditure process. Now with the payroll file, before in Classic, when a payroll um, was um, processed through AutoPost um, on, the, on the USAS side, um, it prompted for a purchase order and a check. Um, this, there is no PO number involved <coughs> excuse me, with um, processing posting payrolls in USAS. It goes straight to the check, and the expenditures are made. So I'm going to go ahead and just click on one of these here. And so I'm not going to be able to post this one because I don't have that period open, but I'll just show you here what it looks like. And so it does pull in all the information from the payroll side. It gives me, obviously, my date here, the description, total amount, what the pay plan was, the start and stop dates of the payroll, and then down here, I have all of the accounts amounts so that um, if they wanted to look through that stuff, they can, obviously. But this total, then, of the amounts here should total up to the total, obviously, in this field. And so they validate this, and then they'll go ahead and post it. Now, reject is going, it will not post, obviously, the file into USAS, and I believe payroll will get a message saying that the file was rejected. 
Um, I don't know 100% what it does with the payroll. Obviously, I think the payroll is still, <clears throat> still there on the payroll side. It's just that file that was submitted to be posted in USAS was rejected. So at that point then, I don't know how often this has been used. Um, I'm not quite sure. I don't want to tell you something wrong. Um, but um, they, I do know at least that they get a notification saying that it's been rejected. And so what happens if I did have this in the correct period here and I post this, I will then go to disbursements afterwards and we'll just pick on um, a payroll type. I should have one in here. There we go. And so here's one and if I view this, obviously when I post it, um, there is an option. Let me go to the documentation because that will explain. Sorry, I didn't have an option here or an example to show you. Oh, wrong one here. To go to pending transactions. So when I'm in here and I click on post, I am going to get this pending transaction post option. And so the first thing it's, it's showing me is this electronic checkbox. If you require a physical check, which we, we do have, I know, um, Nawaka, we have a couple districts that do still take a physical check into the bank. If you require a physical check, you're going to uncheck the electronic box. And then obviously put in the date. If you have a specific bank account, you can select that. Click on post. And then what it's going to do is, you know, you go into disbursements afterwards. And then you can go in there, select that, and generate a print file, assign a check number, and get that physical check that you need. Obviously, if this is an electronic type, that's the, I believe that's the default, and that's what it check marks to. That's going to be an electronic transaction. Again, you would put in your date, um, the account code, click on post, and it's going to create an electronic uh, disbursement. And then, obviously, you have other ways of getting the money, moving the money to the bank. So you don't need a physical check for something like that. So that's what you see after you select post to post that uh, purchase order. You get this pop-up box. And like I said, it get, takes you to disbursements then. And then you can go in and like I said, generate a print file by checking that box and clicking on generate print file. If I just want to view the disbursement, the payroll disbursement afterwards, um, it'll have basically almost that same information that you saw when you were viewing it before you posted it. And then down here, it'll contain all the information from the payroll posting. So this looks different than a regular disbursement because one, I don't have a PO. Two, I don't have an invoice. Didn't create those. It just went straight to a disbursement. So I'm not wasting a PO on a payroll. So um, any questions on this? Um, there is a question here. Um, if you now click show printables, your electronic payments will be listed, not just physical checks. What is the reason um, behind this? So let me go here. So are you talking, I'm sorry, you're talking in, in uh, disbursements, correct? I believe, okay. So um, when I click on show printable, okay, thank you. Okay, so when I click on show printables here, um, you're saying that, let me go and look at my default payment type here.
Okay, so in here, there are four regular checks, and there's also an electronic one. Um, so you're asking why is there will be listed, not just physical checks. What is the reason behind this? So you're asking why is this showing as a printable for the electronic one? And if that's what you're asking, um, well, because uh, there were people that um, wanted to be able to put in a check number for an electronic check. Um, it may be because of how they have things set up with their sorting and filing. Um, they've always had to assign a check number in Classic. Um, so that's why, um, that's why that's there in case they want to assign a check number um, for, uh, on that electronic check in the redesign as well. Um, so I, I think that's what you're asking. If, that, if I didn't answer that correctly, let me know. But um, that's why that that's showing up. Any other questions? Is that an option a district can change or set a rule for? Uh, not that I am aware of. There's nothing, I, I, we could probably set a rule up for it. Um, trying to figure that out as well, because I don't like to see those as well. I feel like I'm missing something with these electronic ones. Um, because if you set it up in here as an electronic check, and I created, so this Jefferson Travel one, so I would want to show check, show printable, and then proceed to select all in the list and print. Yep, and I totally get that. That's the way you should do this, is once you know you've gone in and done your payables, you're basically going to go in here right afterwards and click on show printable, and then find the ones that you want, um, and then go ahead and assign a check number to it. Let me look into that one a little bit. I feel like I need to explain that a little bit better, but I'm just having a moment here as to why that doesn't make sense to me. So let me check on that. I'm going to pick on this Jefferson Travel one. So I will look into that tonight, and we can address that um, tomorrow. I feel like I'm missing something with that one, so you're welcome. Any questions with the... Um, pending transactions at all. So right now, like I said, with pending transactions, you've got your payroll stuff coming over, you've got your board disk and your board rut stuff coming over, and then also the ability to import. And like I said, as far as I know, uh, we've got receipts and reduction of expenditures, I believe, um, can be supported through this. I just don't have the formats yet. So once those are made available to me, um, then a CSV file, I think basically if I try to create it going in to, oh, I'd say like going into receipts grid and going in and doing a report off of the Excel field names, I would think those field names are what I would need in order for this to get imported in properly. Um, but I just, I need obviously to ask. Um, the programming staff about that, and also to see if I can test that out then and see if I can successfully import. I thought I tried to do like reduction of expenditures because of a ticket that we had and it was not working, but I just don't remember off the top of my head if, uh, I think we wrote a JIRA issue for it. Um, I just don't think we have that supporting documentation out there yet for people to do that. But uh, once we do, um, those two, I believe, uh, receipts and reduction of expenditure spreadsheets can be uploaded in. Obviously then, once that spreadsheet set up with the correct column headers for those receipts and reduction of expenditures, you're going to choose that file and click on Upload, and then it will upload it in here then um, so that it can be posted. 
Okay. What else do we have? Our transfers and advances, I believe, are the last thing. And on the transaction menu. And transfers and advances are so easy in here than they were in Classic. Classic had the old ACMOD fund to fund transfer option where, again, you had to put in a PO and a vendor and a check in order to make the transaction. Um, these are so much easier. You just basically go in and click on Create. And then um, from here, it's going to ask you what type. And so if I just select Transfer and put in $500, and then my description from 001 to, I'm not sure if I have a transfer in fun for cafeteria, but we'll give it a shot. And then from here, based on the type that I selected, it's going to pull in those particular accounts. So if I just click the down arrow here, um, I said transfer, so it's going to display all my transfer out accounts. So here is my general fund transfer out, which I'm moving the money out of. And then obviously my credit accounts are going to be my transfer in, and here's my 006 transfer in account. So obviously, if I went and chose advance instead, I would be, this, I would be seeing the 7400s and the 5200s. Um, but because I chose transfer, and then basically that's it. From here, I just click on save, and the transfer's been made. If I made a mistake, I could edit this. Oops, it wasn't supposed to be 500. It was supposed to be 400. Click on save, and it makes the update. So it's 10 times faster than what we had in Classic. Um, there's also with, um, I'm going to do an advance here so you can see the difference. And let's say I'm going to advance $500. Oh, and then again, you'll notice my 74s. And let's make that a 300. <laughs> That's all I have. And then I'm going to advance it to this account. And then from here, when I click on, when I click on this, click on Save, it will create the advance. And here it is right now. And I have a question here. If you enter an advance in error, can you edit and just change it to transfer? and then change, and obviously change the account codes. I believe so. So if I go in and edit this and click on transfer, you'll see how it wipes out the accounts so that I can then go in and you'll notice then that it has the transfer accounts again. So yes, you can do that. I'm gonna cancel out of here. I know, it's very easy. And so from here, here's my advance, and you'll notice then that um, I have a repay option here. And that'll allow me then, when I'm ready for an advance to repay it, I can click on that repay, and it's going to ask me for the amount. So maybe I, I'm not repaying the full amount right now. I'm just repaying $250 of it. I could go ahead and say, yep, $250, and I did this on the 20th, and repay partial. Spell. Partial, and obviously it's going to, I'm on a Mac, so excuse me. Um, so it's going to repay part of it to the originating fund. So it does all of that behind the scenes. And then I just go ahead and click on Save. Well, that's not going to work. And I guess what's happening here is that my source account that I'm trying to repay it back my, my transfer out account, it doesn't exist. So um, I remember I originally went from 001 to the 300. Now I need to go in and take it out of the 300 fund and put it back into the 001. That 300 fund doesn't exist. So it's a good thing to see that. That way I know, oops, I forgot to do my homework and get those accounts set up ahead of time. 
So um, I would have to go in, create those accounts, put money into those accounts, and then go in and actually do the repayment. So that's what this means. This, I'm assuming, is part of this, so not as user-friendly, but um, it's basically meaning that I don't have that transfer out account set up. So I can't do that quite now. And at, somebody asked, and I'm assuming the audits program tracks these? Yes, audits tracks, I think, almost everything in here now. Um, and we had talked about the audits program yesterday as well, the audits report. It's not very pretty right now. Um, it's something that we are working on to make it more user-friendly, so that is definitely something on our list of enhancements that we need to do, but it is. It is um, out there. You, um, you will be able to see any changes, any like transfers and advances that were made, so certainly. Um, we do have a small little issue with um, advances right now. Um, we noticed on importing that um, let's say uh, an advance was made last year and then it was paid back this year and now you're importing the data now for them. Um, the way it looks right now when I look at it on the screen is it is not the, uh, it was paid back in full, the dollar sign is still showing as active and so we created an issue, somebody reported it, one of the ITCs, um, so we have created an issue for that in order to get that fixed um, so that it, I, I didn't look in to see if it allows them to try to repay it again. I'm not 100% sure, but we're going to get that fixed so that it does show that that was fully paid back. <coughs> so again, transfers and advances are very easy. It's just going in picking the account, the amount, adding a description, boom, you're done. And it goes behind the scenes, looks at those accounts, makes those um, expenditures and receipts, you know, a type of a general ledger type of transactions, and um, moves the money to where it needs to be. I think I have taken care of everything that is on the transactions menu here. Just double checking here that I didn't miss anything. I didn't. Uh, one thing for those of you that may not have been on yesterday's call, um, the requisition legacy is going away. Um, at the end of June, we are going to remove it from the system. So, um, so if you do have users out there um, using it, um, they, they will need to be trained on the new requisition user interface. Um, we are trying to whittle away all of these legacy uh, programs from uh, redesign. So the AP invoices is actually the new user interface, because right now it's still legacy, is going to be out on the next release. So, um, and somebody had asked today on the prioritization call if we are going to keep the legacy one out there, and I believe the um, uh, decision made was that it was that we are going to remove it. So you'll see once that new release comes out, you're going to see AP invoices, and it's going to be the new user interface. It's it, there's not a really a huge learning curve at all. It looks just like the old one, you know, except in a grid format. So there's not much of a change. Um, but, you know, it's just a little heads up that that is going to be coming out here within the next release. Unless things change, I believe that it's going to be out here in the next release. The next thing I'd like to um, get into is the budgeting. Um, so one thing I have here as homework for me is to make sure that I check on that electronic checks and why those are showing underneath uh, show printable. So I will check on that um, and get back with you guys on that tomorrow. Um, but I believe that's the only other thing underneath transactions that I needed to look into. Uh, budgeting. So um, we did create a document out there underneath um, the appendix. If I go to appendix here.
and go down to the bottom here. We have a budgeting scenario steps, and it goes through in detail on how to create one, and then from there, how to apply them or promote them um, as proposed amounts, and then to apply them as your initial budget figures. So this does go into detail. One thing I do update on here is the, I think the spreadsheet that I have here. Those need to get updated. They're a little out of date, so that needs to get updated. We created just sample spreadsheets, um, and so uh, that people could use to import the uh, amounts into um, the budgeting uh, module. So uh, that's something I do need to update. Otherwise, everything else should be good to go. I do hear a little feedback again, so if you guys would just mute your phones, that would be awesome here. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go back to my instance and we'll go into scenarios. And so this first one here, um, is showing the scenario that was created. And with these test files, I'm in fiscal year 18, so uh, my current year, and so obviously my next year proposed amounts are gonna be for 19. So I created um, a scenario for fiscal year 19. Um, and so what I think is a good thing to um, stress with districts is that they are probably going to be creating one scenario. Um, they're not going to be creating multiple scenarios um, for the same year. Um, I have a question here. Do we need to be concerned if they have next year proposed amounts for the export-import process? Um, those should be carried over. So if they already have next year proposed amounts in there, when their data gets imported in, those should appear in their next year proposed amounts. Um, if you haven't imported their data, do a test import already, please do that to make sure that you're seeing those amounts in the next year proposed fields. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that those will already be in there but uh, I would test that to make sure. Okay, so in here, like I said, you're just going to have one um, budgeting scenario for the year. What I ran into, and this happened to me last year uh, when one of our districts was on the first wave, is I had them go in and create, this was before I realized that you really only need one, I had him go in and create a scenario for his budget. And so he entered those in and he, import, and he uploaded them in as next year proposed amounts. And we looked at them through the proposed amounts grid. And then he's like, well, I need to do revenues as well. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go back and we'll create another scenario for just your revenue. And we went in and uploaded those in and went to go look out, look at the revenue amounts underneath the proposed grid. They were there. And then we clicked on the budget amounts under proposed and they were gone. And I'm like, oh my, what happened? And then I went back to the office and talked to uh, the programming staff and they said, yeah, if you go in and put in a scenario and import that into the next year proposed and then you go in and do another scenario, it's gonna overwrite the old one. So it's gonna wipe out what's in the next year proposed regardless if it's budget or revenue and replace it with a new one. So my example of having two different scenarios is if a levy fails or passes, <laughs> that way if you do have them in for that the levy, you know, um, you have them set in and the levy didn't pass, you could go in and use your other budget scenario to override that. So what I've been telling people is create one scenario and within that scenario, you are going to be creating several worksheets within there, one for the high school, one for the elementary, one for the junior high. You're gonna be creating several worksheets 
within that scenario. Um, I did have a question here. Um, this might be a little uh, off topic here, but where can we find the documentation for the heading to load additions and deductions for the account? So, yes, that's uh, one other thing that we do not have um, out there yet. What, um, when it comes to additions and deductions, we are still trying, we had somebody ask a similar question last week at the Software Advisory Committee meeting, and we're not sure if we can do something with mass load that will allow you to go in and mass load those um, adjustments. If so, that's what we're, that's what we're look, currently looking into because what we think you could do is use like, um, probably create a custom report and be able to pull those Excel field names um, from there and create a spreadsheet then that can be loaded into mass load. So um, that is something that, yes, that we are addressing because we know that some people um, will want to do adjustments that way instead of going into the budget adjustments option underneath accounts. Um, but once we get that information, we'll get that documented. We just don't have anything out there right now for that. Is there a warning message that promoting a second scenario will replace the existing one? I, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't because I don't remember seeing that warning <laughs> when we did it last year. So, and I don't believe that they've updated that with a warning. Um, that's something I probably have to play around with to see um, if that's been added. So that's a good question. Uh, I'll have to check it out and see if it does provide a warning, but I don't think it does. Um, I don't know if they've added that since that time. So in here, here's my example. So I'm going to open it up, and you'll see that I've got, you know, I've titled it Fiscal Year 19, and these are my budget and revenue figures that I plan to have, my next year proposed amount and you're, you know, looking at, you know, the spreadsheets that I have had, that I've created so far. So you can create the spreadsheets from within the system. You don't have to import them in if you don't want to. Um, and so, and that's what this is for here. This allows you to go in and edit this um, and go in and make changes or I can create one and it will go in and allow me to create a new one. Ah, I do have a message here. Uh, someone said there is a warning on the pop-up when you promote a scenario that says the promotion will replace existing proposed amounts. So it doesn't do it at the, so it doesn't do it when you're creating the scenario, but it is going to warn you when you're actually promoting them. Thank you. Okay, so at this point here, I'm just going to go ahead and click on Create, just to show you what a new one looks like here. Okay, and I know we've made some changes to this, or they're going to be coming up here soon. Um, the first thing you're going to see in here are the fields that it's going to pull over into the spreadsheet. And we're dealing with spreadsheets here. We're not dealing with PDF files or anything like that. We're creating spreadsheets. And so in here, by default, it's pulling in the description of the account code, the dimensions of the account code, and you'll notice I didn't say anything earlier here. I selected budget. So these are my budgets. If I was selecting revenue, I would go down here and it would change my fields to revenue related fields. But I'm going to leave it as budget. Um, and then I have these um, amounts down here, prior year expendable, expended, fiscal year to date expendable, expended, encumbrance, and fiscal year to date unencumbered. So these are um, fields that I have that will, by default will be on my spreadsheet. Now, I can get rid of some of these if I'm not going to use them. So if I don't, you know, I'm in fiscal year 18, I do want to see what my current expended amount is, and I do want to see what my current expendable, 
but I really don't care about what I had for prior expendable and expended. So I am going to get rid of those, at least the expendable one. Um, I'm not looking at encumbrances for now for my current. It's not going to help me, and neither is my unencumbered balance. Now I could go in and add, I believe if I go underneath accounts, I can do prior year. Or maybe I'm just dreaming here. There they are, they're down here. Um, I've got prior year actual expended, so I can click on that and I can pull in the amount field and the fiscal year. And it's going to go out there, and I believe it's going to pull three years' worth um, automatically here on, on that. So I'm just going to pull those in. We'll see what we get. Um, and then underneath configure filters, so these are all the fields that are going to show up or all the columns that are going to show up in my spreadsheet. Now if I want to go in and configure some of those and filter, so maybe I just want cafeteria fund, that's the only thing I'm focusing on right now. I could go in here and say the code is going to equal and that way then on this particular spreadsheet it's just going to be my cafeteria budget account. And I'm going to go ahead and save this. And go ahead, click on Save. And it tells me creation of a new budget account will run in the background and may take several minutes. You may continue working in another browser tab while this is processing. This shouldn't take too long in order to get these, just these 006 ones in here. So it tells me that the budget sheet was created successfully. So here is my cafeteria budgets or my cafeteria spreadsheet that I just did. So in here, I could go in at this point then, because all this did at this point was just create the spreadsheet with the accounts. There are no next year proposed amounts yet. That's next on my list to enter that information in. So I'm going to click on Edit, and I'm going to see what I've got here. So I've got the description. I'm using a, a Mac, so I'm not totally comfortable with how this is going to play out here. Um, so I've got the description. I've got my account code dimensions. I have the prior year expended amount. I've got my fiscal year-to-date um, expended and expendable amount. And remember, I put in um, the last, I'm going to spread these out so you can see these. I also included prior year expended amounts. And right now, this is what it's looking like. So it's going to show me those amounts in order, 2017, 2016, and 2016. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting some background noise again. How about it's called a mesh Wi-Fi, the new mesh Wi-Fi. And the advantage is it gives you three access. OK, I think I got that, OK. Um, and so in here then, I've got my prior year expended amounts as well, and you'll notice that um, it doesn't look, um, it just shows them on these two columns. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that we're going to change in the future. I know that we made those changes on the budget expense worksheet and the revenue expense worksheet, but I don't, um, I'm not sure if they're going to go and make the changes in here as well. But to me, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's showing me what those amounts were, so I can kind of understand, you know, what these were. This is basically an FYI for me to help me plan for the new year. And my next year proposed amounts are going to go in this field. So this is where I'm actually doing the data entry. And I can do calculations in here. I can put in um, a certain calculation and say, we're going to sum this and make it, you know, 
uh, 3% higher than my current fiscal year to date amount. So you can do those same Excel calculations in here, and then you just carry that down through the uh, column. I'm just going to, for ease sake here, I'm just going to add a few here. Okay. So I've got those next year proposed amounts entered in. I'm just going to click on Accept to save the changes. And um, I can do that for any of these. I can go in and make changes to any of these and uh, edit that information. So they're all in here as well. Here's my proposed amounts, PA 2019. So, so you can see how they can create several spreadsheets for that fiscal year. And what can be done then is those spreadsheets can be taken and created, you know, in here, and then they can be downloaded and sent out to those specific people that are in charge of those. They enter in their proposed amounts, and then they can be uploaded back in here. So those spreadsheets can be created outside of here with those proposed amounts already and imported in here, uploaded in here, or they can be created within here and then amounts entered in. So it's just up to the district on what they want to do, and that's where we have this specified in this document. There are different options. So in here, we've got where they can go in and create, this is creating the spreadsheet. and the grid, and here is the option to upload budgeting spreadsheets in the, in the scenario. So that's where we had those budget spreadsheet examples, templates that can be used to pull in. So that's one way to do it, or the other way is just to do it from the actual grid and create the spreadsheet. So they have uh, quite a few options there in order to get their spreadsheets created. So if all these spreadsheets here are created, I'm going to go ahead and save this scenario, um, and I'm at the point now where I'm ready to take these then and promote them to next year proposed amounts. So right now they're not, those next year proposed amounts aren't sitting anywhere except in those spreadsheets that I have in this scenario. So once I have everything in there ready to go, um, and I want to promote all of those, I am going to click on this Promote option, and it's going to go out there and promote the scenario, and I will then see those next year proposed amounts in my proposed amounts grid. And so this is what they're going to look like once they have been promoted. And um, oh, I have a question here. Can I import two separate sheets? one for a scenario named general fund and another one named student activities and then promote both later. So will the second import wipe out the first in this case where the scenarios were d differently named? So if you're talking scenarios, yes, it's going to wipe them out. Um, you're importing one with a scenario, you've got that up or you've got that promoted into these next year proposed amounts you go in with another scenario with different spreadsheets and you import that in and upload, promote those, it's going to wipe out whatever you had in there. So that's why you want to make sure that you've got all of your spreadsheets ready to go underneath one scenario and then that whole thing can be uploaded in. And so what I call this um, proposed um, or this uh, proposed amounts grid, I call this kind of like a working grid here where, yep, your amounts are in here. You can go in and make any changes in here that you need to. So I promoted all of these. If I take a look at this account, I can go in and view it. And if the amount was wrong, I can go in and edit this and change it to what it needs to be. And what it's doing 
is it's going out there and changing my next year proposed amounts. So at this point then, those amounts are getting changed and they're not getting changed just in here, but those same amounts are going to be stored on the account file as well. So this particular account, I have $4,500 in there. If I go out now underneath core and underneath the account option and look up this expenditure account, I'm going to see that same amount in there as well. So it's not just going to be reflected in here. It's also going to be underneath the account UI. So that's one thing that, you know, if they want to check that, they can. But once they promote those accounts, it's going to be stored in here for them to make any changes. And at the same time, those changes will be made under that next year proposed field underneath the accounts. So let's let take, so you can see, you can go in and view one. Obviously, you can go straight to edit, or you can delete. So you don't have, um, you're not going to budget to this account next year. You can just go ahead and click on this and delete it. Some people are like, well, wait a minute, didn't that just delete my account? No, it deleted your next year proposed amount on that account, but it doesn't delete the account, obviously. Um, any questions with this part, with this proposed grid? So this really isn't doing anything other than, like I said, just storing your next year proposed amount. So at this point, if I go back to my budgeting scenario step, I created the scenarios, I uploaded, if I needed to, any spreadsheets that we weren't using outside of here, I promoted those figures, and now it's considered a working grid where I can add, one thing I didn't show you is I can create as well, we went in and looked at uh, an existing proposed amount. We went in and edited one. We can go in and delete one, and we can actually go in and create one. If one was missed, I could go back in here and click on Create up here and actually create one. Obviously, it's an existing account. I'm going to pick on one of these. Fiscal year 2019, and it's $50 and I can go ahead and click on Save, and that will be added. So now I just created an next year proposed amount. Very, very easy to do. Okay, let me go back. So the last thing that needs to be done is applying those proposed amounts. So once all the proposed amounts have been entered for a fiscal year, you've done some work, in the proposed amounts grid, added, deleted, made some changes, whatever needed to be done, uploaded um, some more spreadsheets, and so on and so forth. Um, you can then click on apply to apply them as initial budget or initial revenue figures, depending on what you're wanting to do there. So in here, when you select proposed, um, I'm sorry, when you select apply to apply them, you're going to get this menu here. And I wanted to bring it up in the documentation so you can see what all of these options are for. So it's telling you that this process will set the temporary, permanent, initial budget or your anticipated revenue amounts for the selected fiscal year. If the posting period associated with the date entered does not exist, it will be created automatically. So if I'm in June processing right now, I don't have July open, but these are my July figures, obviously, um, it's going to create that period for me. It doesn't put me in that period. It doesn't overwrite my fiscal year 18 initial budget figures. It creates my fiscal year 19 budget figures, but I won't see those figures until I'm in fiscal year 19, until I'm in um, July, okay? So I know that was a question that we have gotten before. What is that doing? Because this is 2019 and you have it marked as 2019, it's not going to mess up your current year information. 
So you can, you can go in and apply this information now if you wanted to before you closed out the fiscal year. It's not going to change anything in 18. It's when you get into 19 for the you know, fiscal year 19 in July, you're going to then see those initial budget and initial revenue figures in there. So um, the options you're going to see here. So when you're in here, you have transaction types. So there is a temporary, a permanent, and an adjustment option. So if the temporary is selected, check marking the full year option implies that these temporary initial budgets hold true for the entire year. So if you select temporary and that full year is checked, that's what it's going to imply. If temporary is selected, and the full year is not checked, this implies that these temporary initial budgets could change. So maybe it's dependent on a levy that's taking place in November. Um, so you're putting them in there, but you may change them. And that's okay, the system's gonna let you change them. There'll be something kind of in the background in, um, in, in when it audits to show, yeah, these were initial temporaries, and they're going to go in and override it, and they're going to become initial permanents. So, but um, it's just more of an FYI to say, yes, this is considered a temporary for now, but um, depending if I, you know, would need to change these based, you know, on a levy or something like that. And if you do not select temporary and instead you choose permanent, um, the full year is check marked automatically and cannot be unchecked. This implies that these are your permanent initial budgets for the year. If you select adjustment, it adjusts the existing budget amounts via additions and deductions. So the temporary and permanent options are like your NYP options in a probe. Your adjustment option is the PAB mate option in a probe, in Classics of Probe program. So temporary and permanent will update your initial budget or initial revenue figures. The adjustment is going to not affect that initial budget. Those stay as is. It's going to update your expendable and receivable amounts via additions and deductions. So you'll also notice with the adjustment, the update, the gap original estimate amount box defaults to being checked, but you have the option to uncheck that if you don't um, want them updated at the same time. Okay. You're also going to see um, that there is an effective date option, and this automatically defaults to the first day of the new fiscal year. Um, when you're selecting the temporary or the permanent transaction types, if you're selecting the adjustment transaction types, you have the option of entering an effective date. So that adjustment will not become effective until you're in that processing period. Now, I don't see people going in and doing an adjustment and doing it two months in advance, they're probably going to be doing, doing it in the current processing period, but you do have that option of putting that in there. And so what happens then is once you select the transaction type, um, and if, if it's an adjustment, the effective date, you're gonna click on apply to proceed with applying those proposed amounts as your initial budget and revenue estimate. Like I said, you know, if districts want to wait and do these after they've closed for June and they're in July, July is their current period, June's closed, they're in fiscal year, for this example, they're in fiscal year 19, they don't have to do this apply option until then. Um, but if they want to do them ahead of time, they're in June, and they want to get those out there and applied already, that's okay, they can, um, but they're not going to see those initial, those new figures until they're in 
fiscal year 19. Any questions about that? Is the adjustment the amount of change or the new amount of the budget? So the adjusted amount, um, when they're putting in um, whatever that amount is, let's say it was $4,000, and they go in and um, put in a $5,000, that adjustment is going to be the amount of the change. It's going to be the $1,000 difference, and that's what's going to go in as the addition for that account, so that the new amount is now $5,000 expendable. Good question. I kind of wanted to show you, explain this to you with the documentation because I think it makes much more sense because you're reading this as we're going through it instead of just telling you these things um, as we're actually um, going through um, creating one. Um, so I just, I thought it'd be best to show it to you that way. But, you know, when it comes time to apply these here, um, you're going to click on the apply option and that's where you're going to see these figures here that I was just talking about. And I've, you know, I've played around with this. I've gone in and, you know, had a bunch of next year proposed amounts set up and I'm still in May of, like, in these test files in 18 and I went in and I applied them and then I went out there and looked to see, okay, where are those initial budget amounts? Well, they're not, they're stored but they're not available for me to see um, on the accounts until I get into that fiscal year. So I went in and, you know, it created, when I did the apply, it's going to open up that period. doesn't make it current, but it's going to open it. And so then I made July current to see what it looked like, and it matched my figures that I had uh, for the new year. And then I went in and made May, my current period again, and it reflected my fiscal year 18 figures. So it's just, you know, something that they will be doing, um, you know, once, maybe twice a year, um, depending on if they're doing adjustments and things like that. So I think just like a probe, I, you know, I don't know about you guys, but it seemed like our districts were never really 100% comfortable with it because they're only doing it once or twice a year. Um, and so because it's a little bit of a process, and um, I think that they may, you know, because this is a little bit of a step-by-step -step process, um, it may be hard for them to remember this every year, but, boy, it is so easy to go in. That proposed amounts grid is an awesome thing where they can go in, upload whatever they want, and then monkey around with those figures to get what they want, it's so much easier than when, what you had to do in classic with like the NYP load stuff. This is so much easier. You've got your spreadsheet. You can save those spreadsheet formats every year, and all they have to do is change the year to PA 2021 and then enter in their amounts, make any changes to the accounts, and upload those in. And then they've got them on the working proposed amounts grid, make changes they need to, apply them, and go ahead and do the same thing the next year. So I think once they get onto it, it'll be a pretty easy process for them. Just this first time around is um, it's just something, you know, different for them to get used to. So scenarios is where you create that scenario. And then once you go in and promote those, you're going in the proposed amounts to get them adjusted, whether it's budgets or revenues. And then once you're ready to go to apply them as your initial figures for the new year, you would use the apply option to apply them. So that's it. That's all there is to it. Okay. We are going to move on. Um, I'm going to try to get through the majority of the periodic menu um, today. 
so that we can um, focus on reports and some of the system stuff um, tomorrow. So um, any questions about the transaction or the budgeting menus at this point? I got a great, um, and some people seem to be pretty excited about this, so I'm glad that the budgeting, and that step-by-step, -step, you know, um, process there in the appendix will, I mean, that's what you need to reference. Again, if you want to take that um, and um, download it into a Word document and make any, you know, tweaks that you need to for your districts, please do so. Um, it's just a general guideline, and from there you can add or remove whatever you need to so it makes more sense for your districts. We're going to try and do more of that type of stuff when it comes to these type of processing um, things that we have, you know, like budgeting process and stuff like that. So we're going to try to get those out there in the appendix for you guys so that you guys, it may be basically an outline or template for you guys to work from, and then you guys can customize it for your districts. So under the periodic, we've got fiscal year-end type of programs, we've got calendar year-end uh, programs in here, and um, we've got um, the um, certificate uh, reports and stuff. Yesterday, we talked about the fund tab um, underneath the account UI and how you can set things up in order for these appropriation resolution and the certification reports um, to run. And so I wanted to go into those first in case we need to tie that back to our funds. Um, so the appropriation resolution is the APRES report in Classic. So in here, it's going to ask them for the fiscal year. Um, the amounts to use, so this is really similar to the old classic program. You know, you want the beginning balances, you want next year proposed, so maybe this time of the year if they're doing their next year proposed amounts and they want to run appropriation resolution based on those, once they get those next year proposed amounts, um, you know, promoted in there, they can go ahead and run the report with those. Um, you've got the fiscal year to date appropriation plus carryovers and their totals, and then fiscal year appropriated minus current um, carryover encumbrances um, and the totals from there. I'm just going to pick on this one. Do I want to include accounts um, with zero balances? So do I want those included in here or not? So we had that same option available in Classic. And then um, the format here. How do you want to see this? So lots of different ways. Um, and so what happens then is you'll get your um, appropriation resolution, and if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to the documentation because I want to show you something that was added that I'm hoping will be helpful for everybody. I just did this not too long ago. Um, I'm going to go to periodic, and I'm going to go to the appropriation resolution here. And I'm going to go down here. And down here it explains, you know, what all these options are. And it's also got um, information about the narrative data, um, the appropriation resolution narrative in the, appraise, um, the APP RES program in Classic included the date, time, location, and the listing of the board members that are adopting that resolution. Um, we don't have that as part of the report that gets created. There is a separate Word document that we created, and you click here for a sample narrative, and then the district can fill in the necessary information on that. So that's one thing I wanted to point out, because we have gotten questions from people about the narrative. Where, where is that information at? Because it's not on the report that gets generated. You have this extra document. I know someone had asked, is there a possibility, an option to add that in the future? And I believe we created um, a JIRA issue to discuss that to see if we're going to either create a separate report for the narrative or if we're going to actually include an option within the appropriation resolution report um, underneath periodic to be able to generate that. Uh, funding levels for report, this was what I'm kind of tying back to 
um, what is out there in the um, fund level, fund button underneath the account UI. So if we would go back to those funds there um, and take a look at these, um, the select um, the resolution reporting levels, it would be these guys, first of all, do you want it included in the appropriation resolution? So do you want that fund included? And then you've got your resolution levels. So these need to be set up ahead of time before the appropriation resolution. I think everything is checked by default when it gets imported in. So when a district goes and runs their appropriation resolution for the first time, um, they probably want to take a look at it, make sure it's got all the funds or if they need to exclude funds off of there. They need to go into the fund underneath the account UI and make changes in there. That's where they're making those changes. Um, and one other thing. And maybe it's not in the appropriation resolution. It must be in the certification reports. Um, there's another blurb, and we'll talk about that once we get to those. But I'm going to go ahead and generate this. And this is going to um, run my fiscal year 18 report, is what it's going to do. So this is the appropriation resolution. The others are under the certifications. When you think about those, uh, reports that are tied um, to like the budgeting process. Um, in Classic, you had USA CERT. So USA CERT had um, CERT Bell, it had the appropriation resolution, and your amended certificate programs. Those were, those were the three main programs. And so um, we're you know, running the appropriation resolution right now. Well, that's running. I'm going to go in and we're going to look at these certification reports. The amend cert and the cert bell are underneath this option. And so the first thing you need to select is which one do you want to run. So we've got um, amended certificate detail and summary and the cert bell detail and summary options. So if I go to um, the cert bell option, the summary report, then things change a little bit on the screen. It's going to ask me for the fiscal year. I do have the option to exclude certain funds, and you'll notice the little hover over, the little tooltip. You're going to use this for excluding budget reserve funds, student activities, or anything else that you know, the district wants to exclude. So it's up to the district uh, what they're excluding from this report. In order to exclude them, I have to use the plus sign. So when I click on that, then I put in whatever it is and um, it's going to exclude that specific account from my report. So that's one way of doing that. Also down here, principal amounts for permanent funds. So um, that, I think, was screen three of the CERT bell. I can't remember for sure. But what this is going to do is whatever amount is entered in here, is going to be subtracted from the July 1st cash balance exactly the way that it worked in Classic. So I can go ahead and click on this again, enter in the account, the fund, and the principal amount, and that will be subtracted. So it's only going to include the interest off of those. Um, advances not repaid. So again, that was another option that we had, one of the screens, the many screens of the CERT Bell program in Classic. Um, so again, you're going to enter in, and we have a little blurb again, amount of advances not repaid from July 1st of the prior year for this fund special cost center. And it's even telling you, you should be entering in a positive amount for the fund that made the advance and a negative amount for the fund that will be making the reimbursement. So if I did an advance from the 001 to the 006, my 001 was the one that made it, so that's going to be a positive amount. My 006 is the one that's going to be making the um, reimbursement, so that's going to be a negative amount. So that's how that works. And then from there, I can go ahead and generate the report. So with this, if I go back to my documentation here, 
back to periodic and go back to the certification. And I'm just going to talk about the cert valve part here. Um, it talks about each one of these here. And then in here as well. Um, I want to kind of, oh, I guess I don't have it there. There's an example of it. And then I've got down here the report columns calculation. So this seems to be always a struggle uh, with um, districts and sometimes with ITC staff as to where are these figures coming from on this cert -val report. Um, so where is this cash balance? figure what makes up that amount. And so we have down here, we never documented that in the classic um, program. I think it might have been down at the bottom of the report when the report generated and explained those, but we don't have that in redesign. So I put the report calculations on here um, to make so that you guys know exactly where these amounts or your end users know where these amounts are coming from. So, you know, the July 1st cash balance is coming from, obviously, their cash balance at the end of the fiscal year. The encumbrances, um, where are those coming from? The advances not repaid, um, the carryover balance, the total amount from all available expenditures, what is that? So a lot of people think that that's a received amount, and it's not. It's the receivable. So we made sure to note that in there, that these are the receivable figures that they're getting. And then, you know, this last column, where is that coming from? So we made sure that those were noted in here. Um, also, with um, cert Bell and the amended certificate, um, there are some setup there. There is some setup underneath the fund um, UI that you could say is this going to be included in the certificate uh, program. So you can have that set in there one time. You don't have to worry about resetting it again. Um, so there are some things underneath there, underneath the fund UI that are tied to this. Um, I do have my appropriation report here created. So you can kind of see what that looks like. And what I selected in there was total appropriation, um, and, and then my prior carryover equals my appropriated amount. So your total appropriation would be your initial budget plus or minus any adjustments. And then if you have any prior carryover, that's included in there to equal your appropriation amount. So that's what that's for. And that's because that's the option that I selected when I was in there. So it's a pretty clean report. So, and at the bottom, obviously, you're going to see totals. So. Okay. I'm going to go back to the actual instance, and I want to show you the amended. So this was the summary option. There is also a detail option. Um, so the summary is going to be more of a summarized report, whereas the detail won't be summarizing all of it, it'll be listing all the details of all the accounts that are involved in it. Your amended certificate looks very similar. Um, there are a couple little extras here. Um, the amended certificate has got some tax options in here, um, how you want the property tax allocations to go. So, and I believe once you check mark these, they should be set, so you don't have to check them again. Um, so in here, I would select these property tax allocations. I think if you hover over, yeah, some of these, it'll show you the actual um, dimension that this is coming from. So income tax is coming from the 1130, and other taxes is coming from 1190. Now this is an amended certificate of estimated resources. That right there tells me I'm talking about receivable amounts. So it's looking at my receivable figures. And again, then I have those same options that I had in the certificate program, the ability to exclude fund special cost centers, the principal amounts, advances not repaid, and generating my report at the end. So going back um, to the documentation, 
again, we do have, go back to that. I go to the amended certificate option here. We do have those calculations showing here. Here we go, report calculations. Um, this one seems to be the one we have most questions on. Where is this unencumbered balance as of July 1st coming from? What makes up that calculation? And it tells you right here where this is coming from. So these are things that we documented so that districts are aware that um, their unencumbered balance is their July 1st cash balance minus prior year carryover encumbrances plus advances not repaid minus any principal amounts that they entered um, on the screen. So your taxes and other sources columns, those next two columns, that's where I think we get a lot of questions because people think it's received amount, it's receivable. So we made note of that to say, you know, if they never entered any receivable amounts, they're not gonna see anything in here. So it's not received, it's receivable. And then obviously the total then is the calculation of columns one and columns two and three. So we thought it would be best to add those in there so it makes a little more sense to everybody as to what they're looking at. And down at the bottom then, we have the fund reporting levels again that explains what things on the fund that you can change. Um, so again, here if I go to the actual fund, there is a um, certification reporting level for the fund. And in there, it's right, there it is, it's right here. So for the 001 fund, do I want my certificate reports, meaning my certificate or my amended certificate, do I want those to show fund special cost center or just by fund? So that's what those are for. Like I said, these other two pertain to the appropriation resolution. So do I want this fund included on my resolution? And if so, how do I want my resolution levels to look for this fund? So for the general fund, it may be broken down by um, fund special cost center, and then maybe for all your 200 funds, you just want them all rolled up into one. So you might have that just by fund. It just depends on what the district you know, wants to do. But like I said, the fund UI um, underneath the accounts um, is where this stuff gets set up. And then from there, you run those reports and it will look at these settings. Any questions? I don't see anything in the chat window. I'm going to go back to the menu here. Hopefully the documentation helps there to explain those so you can refer that to um, your end users. So we went over the cert val reports, basically the old classic cert val, these two options right here. Um, building profiles, this is a fiscal year end. So this is basically the replacement for the USA EMS EDT program. And we will cover this when we go through fiscal year end um, together, when we do our fiscal year end redesign uh, session in a couple weeks. Um, but this is where they're gonna go in and enter in um, their profile information. So when they click on create, they're gonna enter in their IRN, the description, the square footage, transportation, and lunchroom. So this is USA EMS DB um, program. Um, now one part of the old USA EMS DB is the central office square footage. Um, that is not in the periodic menu that is under core, underneath organization. Down at the bottom, you're gonna see two fields, one for central office square footage and the other one for ITC IRN. So um, I don't know if those get pulled in off the import. I'm thinking they don't because I think one of our first wave districts last year had to enter that in there. So real easy, they just go in and look off classic. What is my central office square footage? You know, what is the ITC's IRN? And they plug that in there. One time and it's done. They don't have to worry about that again. 
So the rest of the USA EMSDB is entered in the building profile, and that's the transportation and lunchroom percentages. So they will enter those in there, and what's nice about that, once they're entered in, they just can go in and update these every year. So it's already in there. They just need to make those changes um, to their square footage and their transportation lunchroom percentages. Um, you know, square footage probably won't change a whole lot, but obviously their transportation and lunchroom per, uh, percentages um, are going to change. Okay, so I'm just going to click on Create so that you can see what this is going to do. So um, I'm going to put in Elementary, Sampleville Elementary, and my square footage, and my transportation percentage for the fiscal year was 50, and my lunchroom was 75 or something like that and then you just click on Save. Um, oh, I do have another question here. Do you have to enter square footage of central office in building profile and in core? No, um, your, the central office is only in the um, organization underneath core. You don't have, you do not put it in here. Good question. You're just putting in your transportation your square footage of that building, that's your central office of all your buildings, um, and then that building's transportation and lunchroom percentages in here. So basically, um, USA EMS um, EDT, or USA EMS DB is the building profile. The first option of USA EMS EDT in Classic, which is the Cash Rec, is in here, Cash Reconciliation. Um, this um, is a pretty sweet option um, because you can go in and create your Cash Rec, you know, for your first um, month that they're on the redesign, and then from there you can go in and clone that for the next month. So it's such an easy process, and it's so much nicer than the cash rec option in, I never got used to the cash rec option in Classic. Um, so here's an example of one that's already been entered. I'm just gonna go in and open this up so that we can see it. And so this is their January reconciliation sheet. Um, and so they're entering in their gross deposits here, so, what they would need to do, let's say I have two banks here, I'm just gonna put in my other bank so you can see how they're adding these in. And let's say it's, and I just click on add, and it adds that to it. And then you'll notice that the total gross depository balances are off here to the side, adding it up. So, and then if that's something that you know is wrong or it's not to be included in here, you can just click on the X and it will get rid of it. Your cash in transit to the bank has to be manually entered, so does your outstanding checks. So they could run an outstanding check report um, and get their outstanding checks and plug that amount in here. I know one time we talked about maybe eventually, and it's probably a future enhancement, of the system calculating this itself, um, but for now they're gonna have to go in and manually enter that. Any adjustment amounts will be entered in here, and when they do that, then they'll get they'll display in here, and those total amounts will appear over in the total adjustments, um, which carries down to here. Um, treasury bonds and notes, um, CDs can be entered in here. Other investments, those total other investments get entered in here. Petty cash. Again, they get entered down here, and they'll show up in here, and there's the total amount of the petty cash. Uh, a change cash as well. They have the separate change cash fund as well. They could put that stuff in here, and that, then that total will show up here. And then cash with the fiscal agent, 
I, they can put that in there, I guess, manually. So basically, um, what happens then is it goes out there and adds up all of the amounts that were physically entered in here, and that is the total balance. That balance has to match the balance that's coming from the system, and that is your fund balance. So just like the old classic cash rec, it had the total balance appearing first of what you entered in, and then right below that, it had the total fund balance that came from the system. Those have to match. If they don't, you'll get a warning message when you're trying to save the reconciliation sheet. It won't prevent you from um, saving it. It'll just give you a warning. So districts do have to pay attention to that to make sure. There's also an area there, too, where they can include their uh, total depository clearance balances, too, if they just want those displayed on their cash rec as well. And so what, oh yes, I got a comment, so much more user friendly, it is. And I was, in one of our districts was so excited because once she created this, um, basically when she was ready to um, do her cash rec for the next month, I said, clone it. She's like, I can take it, that's gonna include all my adjustments and all my you know, petty cash stuff. And I'm like, yep, it all gets pulled in there. All you have to do is go in, change your amounts, and save it. And what's really nice is that these stay out here then, and you have a running total of every month. I mean, I don't know how useful or that is for the districts, but I think it's just nice to know that all your cash rec reports are all in the same spot. Any questions about the cash rec? I was always scared to go into the classic one because I felt like I could never get out of the darn thing. Um, so I think this one is just so much nicer. I know that um, we've had a couple people report um, performance issues with the cash rec, that it was taking a long time for them to, to click, once they clicked on create, it was taking a long time for um, the cash rec window to open. Um, now that, I have not, I've heard that from only one ITC. So if you guys that do have users on the redesign are experiencing problems with the cash rec, please let us know. Um, because that's something, if we get a lot of feedback here, we, we can um, bump that up and see what's going on. But We've only heard that just, you know, from a couple districts from one ITC. So I don't know if it's a real, we don't know if it's a real issue with the software yet or what's going on with that. So um, if we get more feedback from the other ITCs, then maybe it really is something that we need to look into. Okay, so cash rack certification, other fiscal year end. Um, Options that you're seeing down here, these are the other USA EMS EDT options. You've got civil proceedings and your federal assistance detail and summary reports. So I'm gonna go to civil proceedings first. It's such an easy thing. You're just going in and creating your civil proceedings, if they have any, um, for the fiscal year. And so um, you're just basically, everything that's in red are things that are required. So I gotta put all this information in, what's the year, the proceeding number, the court information, the participants, and then basically you're saving that, and that's it. So not much to it. Um, and what's nice is it stays out there. So you know, you know, these court cases will take longer than just a year, so the next year you'll still have that information and you can just make updates to it. Um, what else do we have here? We've got the federal assistance detailed summary. I'll go to the summary first. Um, and so in here, this is just like the Fed sum option in USA EMS EDT. So they're putting in the fiscal year. Um, over here, assistance over threshold. So it does have a little um, tooltip here. Check if you have $750,000 or more in federal expenditures for this period. Any comments that you need to make? 
um, regarding this, and then it pulls the county and the entity from your configuration screen. So you don't have to worry about that. And you just save that. And I believe, I think last year, I can recall, I believe we had to run the summary option first before we ran the detail option. So I'm going to check on that. Um, and that's something I'll confirm when we go through the fiscal year end steps for the redesign. But I believe you had to do summary first, and then you had to go in to the detail option and enter that in. Maybe that's changed this year, but I know we had to do that last year. So in the detail, obviously this is a spinoff, obviously, of the summary. So you're putting in the federal assistance numbers, um, the line number, CFDA number, the grant um, title, the cash account that's tied to it, and what was received or expended for the year for that grant. So there is no, oops, I meant to do cancel. Um, so there is no initialize or anything like that. I do kind of miss that because it would go out there and go out there and find all your 500 funds in Classic and pull those figures in. So now it's just a matter of going out to the grid or run a report of your 500 funds and you're going to have to enter those amounts in. But again, once it's in here, they're in here for good. So next year you can go in and edit this and add new um, funds or remove old ones and make any changes to their amount. So let's see, I think that's it for fiscal year end. Um, so you've got your you know, cash rec, which those that choose to do it monthly will do it monthly, but then everyone will do it then at the year end, fiscal year end. You've got um, your civil proceedings and your federal assistance detail and summary and your building profile information. Those are considered your fiscal year end, some of your fiscal year end steps. Obviously, we've got other steps in there as well. When we get to some of the reports, like the USAS odd reports and stuff like that, that are part of your fiscal year and steps. And again, we'll be going through all of this when we go through our fiscal year and checklist here in a couple weeks. Okay, any questions on those? The next thing I'm gonna talk about is, I don't think I've skipped anything yet, um, the five-year forecast, and I really like this option um, in the redesign, and I think the reason I like it so much is the um, CS or the Excel option in here. What's, you've got two different options in um, the five-year forecast. You've got a CSV type and an Excel type. So CSV, let's just talk about what you're seeing here on the screen. So the, what you're seeing basically is all of your line item numbers, the description of it, um, forecast line number, and again, I think that you've got the more option up at the top here. I gotta move my chat window out of the way. Oh, maybe you don't. Um, so these are the, the set um, fields that you're gonna have, the account code, um, and then um, the uh, amounts here. So these were your prior year amounts, your percentage average change, and your current year figures. So this reminds me a lot of like the old USAS FF um, program. And so basically what it's gonna do then is it's going to go out there and either create a CSV file that a district can take then and upload to if they've got some type of third party software they're using, like Ernie and Stacy's, they can take this and pull that in there if they want to. If they use state software's forecast, they can click on this Excel option and generate this. And what's going to happen then, it's going to create, take, it's going to take a little bit for that to run, but it's going to create the Excel version in the SSDT forecast. So when I go in there then, I'm already in state software's forecast page. So I basically can go in and add my 
you know, your, my forecast amounts generate that, it creates the file that I can then go in and upload into EMIS FFE. It's so neat. Let me go in, click on that. And so this is what it's going to look like. So you can tell already, if those of you that are familiar with the forecast, this is state software's five-year forecast. So it takes me right to the parameters page. And so it's already got, you know, all the information for that district, the fiscal year. And at this point, I can go click on the data tab and look at all the data that's entered in here that got pulled over, which is awesome. And then from there, I can go to my forecast page, and it's going to bring up my actual forecast page. You guys able Michelle, to see it? Michelle, we're not seeing the forecast Excel file at all. I don't know why that's not showing up. I've got it on my screen. Can you see, can you see my I just see the still? original five-year forecast uh, grid. And I see your mouse um, cursor running around, but um, in the five-year forecast uh, download at the bottom. But you when can't. you have it open, I do not see the file at all. I, it must the be multi -tab something. Excel. With, it must be something with my Mac that it is not allowing me to pull that up. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure why mm -hmm. it. It looks really good. <laughs> maybe, sure. maybe if you shrink down your um, redesign. Um, Maybe this, and then, then click on the five year forecast. Let me try that and see if that helps at all. Can you guys see it now? No, just a blank screen now. <laughs> How about now? Can you see it? Oh, nope. Well, shoot. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar with this Mac here, so I'm trying to figure this out. Let me get out of here. And I'm going to shrink this back down. And go back. Can you guys see this screen at all? It's a Google screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, just making sure. I think I accidentally X'd out of that other instance and I didn't mean to, so let me pull that back up real quick. I got the wrong one. Hold on a minute. There we go. Sorry about that. I don't know why that would not come up, but you guys can play around with it. But what that will do is it does pull it in to the SSDT forecast with all the information already loaded in there. So basically, they're going to go in then and, you know, add those, you know, future amounts and then be able to save that file and upload it into um, EMIS FFE. So it just saves them a lot of time. If they're using the state software forecast, they can use that Excel option and it will take care of most everything. So if, obviously if they're using outside of the state software um, forecast, then they would probably want to use the CSV option. One other thing I wanted to show you guys, if I just go back in there real quick. So in here, it does show you um, in the forecast all the different line numbers and all the accounts that make up those line numbers here. It's showing them all in here. So obviously, more, if there's more than one account tied to that line number, it's going to show that in here. Another thing um, is underneath reports in the report manager, we also have a five-year forecast. Let 
It's called the Financial Report by Forecast Line Number. And if I go in and generate that, it's just another tool out there that's related to the forecast. And I'm just going to go ahead and just click on the Generate option here. And I'm hoping you guys will be able to see this as it gets up and running. You guys were able to see my Appropriation Resolution Report earlier, so must just be something with the Excel. Can you guys see this okay? Yes. Great. Um, so this, again, is um, uh, the same thing that we saw in that grid, but you can see where it's totaling it up um, by each forecast line number. So it's, the basic, it's, a re it's basically the report of the grid, but in a pretty format here. Um, so it shows you exactly um, the different accounts that make up those forecast line numbers. So this is something else, again, that the district can look over to make sure that whatever they receded in was, you know, it was probably receded into the right account because these are the accounts that are going to get pulled in. And if districts aren't sure um, what those um, accounts are in ODE's manual, in the EMIS manual, there is a chapter on the forecast, and it goes in and says these, you know, function or object codes are tied to the expenditure lines on the forecast. These receipt codes, specific ones, are tied to these specific forecast line numbers. So um, all of that's detailed in there, and obviously that's where we take our information from, what ODE has in their manual. All right. I'm just going to go through the rest of the periodic menu, and then we'll call it a day. Um, there are two other things I'd like to talk about, and that's the spending plan and the 1099 extract. So since we're talking about budgets and stuff like that, we'll go to the spending plan first. So this is the replacement for the SM1 mate option. Um, so if I go in and click on this, it probably will start to look a little familiar to you because when you're in the SM12 program and you access SM1 Maint, these are this is basically what it looks like. Um, it's asking for the fiscal year, um, the uh, ODE line number, and then from there you can plug in your specific um, amounts that you're estimating. So, and then this is tracked on the system, and you can run reports. We've got, I'll show you those in a little bit here, that are in the report manager, template reports, where you can run your estimates versus your actuals. And the actuals obviously are stored on the actual expended amounts um, or, you know, receipt amounts in um, the system. Um, but this is how they're entering in their SM1 mate figures. I'm not sure how many of your districts used SM1 mate. Some of them use them read religiously. Others used them due to um, maybe some type of financial situation that they had to, like, like a fiscal emergency type of situation. And there are others that I know have never used this option. But we wanted it out there um, for those districts that do want to do their forecasted amounts in here. These are just their estimates. And underneath report, we have several reports underneath here. And I need to move my chat. Um, underneath the SSDT reports, and they're called spending plan. Yes. I'm just going to filter spending. Oh, I forgot to put those in. And so these are the three SSDT spending plan reports that we have. 
um, we have a monthly, a summary, and a comparison report. So the monthly, if I click on that one, is going to ask me for um, the fiscal year. And when I generate this, it's going to show me um, every month, I believe. Yes. So, and it's obviously it's broken down by five-year forecast line number. So for that fiscal year. And then the summary, I believe, is yearly. Oh, no, I can go in and put in the fiscal year and then I can specify what months and then generate that. So again, both of these reports are your actual figures. Um, I'm sorry, and they do have the estimates as well. The comparison report will show your actuals versus your estimates. So that's like the SM2 CMP report that we had out there in Classic. And so if I actually had figures entered in my spending plan program, then it's basically going to look at those and compare them to my actual figures and then give me the difference for each forecast line number. So those are the three that we have out there now. So those are replacing some of those reports that used to be out there in the SM-12 program. Okay. And the last thing I want to show you today is the 1099 extract. And so this is something that we feverishly worked on last calendar year. We made a lot of tweaks and stuff before the end of the year to get everything on there. So hopefully this year we won't have um, really anything to do with this. Um, so this is your F1099 replacement in Classic. So it's got a lot of different things in here. Um, it's got different things that we can select. Do we want to produce the tape file or do we want to produce the XML file or do we just want to print a report? So you got three really different options in here. And so um, we have the option to exclude vendors with no tax ID. We have that same option in Classic. It pulls in everything from the configure from the organization screen in here, and then um, the payment year, the amount type, which these are all defaulted, and then once um, and if you have a payer uh, name control, um, you can put that in there as well. We have that same option in Classic. So based on what's centered here, then you get the output file you want. So if I need the .tap file, I already have it selected, I click on Generate Extract File and I'll get my tape file. I have to run it again in order to get my XML file for printing, generate that one. And then like I said, if I want to, before I do either one of those, I just want to print a report to see what it looks like um, and then I'm going to change this to 18. I'm going to change this to 17 since my data is so old, and print report, it's going to generate the PDF file, which I had a feeling I wouldn't have anything on here. Um, I don't have much information in here, but it would show my 1099 vendors, and it would look very similar to uh, what you see in the classic F1099 program with the address information, and it's one thing to keep in mind is when we went over vendors yesterday um, and we did locations done at the bottom, we had to check the PO address and the 1099 address. So it is going to be pulling that 1099 address onto this. Obviously, if there isn't a 1099 address, it's going to default to the PO address, and that's the address that's going to appear in this report. It's going to include the um, amount 
And I believe that's it. I'm going to go pull it up, go to our wiki page. I want to show you where all of this stuff's at as well. So if I go down to the documentation, and go to Report Manager, And we do have a 1099 uh, vendor report as well. Um, and this will kind of show you the same thing here. And I think I have a screenshot of it. So it's basically showing you the type of 1099. Um, so it, it's subcategorized that way. So these are all my non-employee compensations. I've got a vendor number, the name, the 1099 address information, um, what Type again, which is non employee compensation. Is this an SSN or EIN? The number and then the amount, the taxable amount. So, same thing. And I don't know if we have a screenshot of the report underneath the actual option. Let me look here and see in under periodic. Go down to the 99 extract and see if I've got a report in here. No, I didn't think I did. So, um, but the report that's created in here looks very similar to that template report that we have out there. So that's the first thing that they would do is run that report, make sure that everything's there, and if all looks good, then they would go in and create the XML and the TAP files. So obviously this is something that we'll talk about um, when we go through the calendar year end steps here later this fall. Um, but, uh, but we did have a, a few things to work out here at the end of last calendar year, but we got everything squared away. Um, but um, so same thing, we've been through a calendar year, we've been through a fiscal year. So, um, so I'm thinking, you know, this fiscal year and calendar year, um, will be much more smooth sailing for us since um, all of this information is already out there. We've just been tweaking things now. I know one thing that um, we discussed um, at our last team meeting was um, the VAL Act report that we had in Classic. We have a validation report, account validation report in the redesign right now, um, but I think we need to tweak it a little bit more to get a little more information on it other than just invalid dimensions. So that's something I know that they're focusing on here uh, to get ready here for fiscal year end. Um, otherwise, I think all the rest of the uh, reports and programs are already in place. Uh, one thing I had talked to you guys about underneath the reports module was the auditor reports as well. It's not a, it's not a program anymore like it was USAS Aud. Um, there's three separate reports. Um, that they're going to run, and then those reports will have to be physically emailed to the Auditor State's office. Um, but those, I believe, are down here at the bottom. Yes, the Auditor Extract for Accounts, Transactions, and Vendors. So when they go in and pull one of those up, there's not going to be really an actual option to go in and say, send this to AOS now like we had in the past. They will have to generate those reports and then email them to the other state's office. And again, we have that all listed, uh, or we will have that all listed in our fiscal year end checklist. Okay, any other questions? So I believe, yeah, there's no prompt or anything like that. I believe we have finished everything for, um, through the periodic menu. Um, tomorrow, um, we'll go in and start looking at reports and some of the system and some of the utilities options, and we'll finish our day with all of those. I have been recording this, so I will post this recording out there under the Friday webinar 
That was something I wanted to show you guys, is show you um, what we have out there right now, just so you know where um, everything is at. I go back to the wiki here. Um, all of that information is underneath the redesign. Um, so I just go down to the redesign area here, and um, we've got all of it listed here. So state software redesign, and there's our Friday webinars. So what I did then this morning is I went in and started adding um, these uh, trainings that we've been doing. So like I said, I've got one of Lori's. I just need to get the other one from her, and then she'll be rescheduling her system utilities and reports menus option. And then I did put in yesterday's um, session in here, and then I'll add today's as well. So any other questions? Uh, we had a question here about, speaking of fiscal year end, when will there be documentation on your website? Actually, we do, I believe, have documentation for fiscal year end out there. Um, I believe it's back here. We have an area here for SSDT meetings and trainings. And in there, we've got our meetings materials. And so I just need to update this. Um, and so we do have the classic um, webinar coming up this Friday. So yeah, this needs to get updated here and to get that stuff out. So this will be updated before Friday, so don't do anything <laughs> yet until Friday. Um, and then we are also going to update uh, the redesigns, fiscal year end stuff. So this was last year's. We have not updated that yet, um, but we will definitely be adding that. So when it comes to this Friday's, it's here. I just need to tweak it a little bit. So. Give me a couple more days here and we'll get that taken care of for you guys. Any other questions? All right, everybody, thank you for attending today and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, thank you.